It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. So the economy has really been upsetting for people who are just approaching retirement, have just entered retirement. What in the world do you do now? And later, grocery prices have gone sky high and we all want to save when we shop. So should you use an app that pays you cash back when you're shopping? We reviewed one recently. I want to tell you about it. Talk about grocery strategies generally. So this is really, really, really hard. If you were green lighted, let's say you use one of the uh, algorithms, one of the Monte Carlo algorithms that said, you're good, you're good, you can retire, never worry about money again. Or you have a financial person, the man or woman you go to for advice at the firm, and they said, hey, you're good, go, go have a great life. And then all of a sudden, you see your portfolio just go, and you're worried. Are you going to outlive your money? Are you going to have to live the life of you were expecting to live a comfortable life and now you've got to scrimp all over the place, which was the whole point in retirement that you wouldn't have to do that. That's why you saved all that money. So what are you to do? Okay. Well, new survey says, survey says people approaching retirement that one in four of them are now delaying their retirement that we're about to. And that's pretty crushing if you'd been looking forward to a date certain and work was going to be in your rearview mirror. And now you're having to say, I'm going to keep working. So there's things between the absolute stark choice of I keep working or I don't. And it's part-time work. And in this job market, more and more employers have been rethinking their historical age discrimination and been thinking, you know what? Jane knows so much about blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't it be great if we had her back part-time or if we paid her as an independent contractor? And I've been seeing this, hearing this, that, that this is the potential compromise that you work two days a week maybe is what it is so you work one day a week you don't go back to working five days a week but see the advantage if you're able to bring that money in in the early years of what becomes semi-retirement instead of flat out retirement your health's still good two on five off it's pretty great. One on six off, pretty great. Yeah, you're not every day ending in a Y. You're still going to work one or two days a week. But I've told the story from time to time about my father-in-law, who was a pediatrician. And he went from five days a week to three days a week at first and then went into more semi-retirement after a couple of years, two days a week, did that for a few years, and then he didn't have to worry about it anymore, had enough financial reserves that the last 20 years, he's been retired, retired. And so doing a little bit to give that wallet a little more heft, because later in retirement, Maybe you're not going to be able to do that. And I do see people regularly who are much, much older, and you can tell they're working not because, hey, this is great. I'm so excited to be working. They're working because they're at a point in their lives that they would rather just be hanging out, but they need the money to deal with the most basics of life. And I don't want that for you. I want you to when you're uh, a younger semi-retiree to bring in that money, build that cushion, build that security, 
and be in a place where you create that safe zone for money going through your years. Also, the hit against our investments is not a permanent thing, but it has so much more impact early in retirement if you have to draw on some of that money. So you're buying yourself some time with the part-time work to not have to take money out of your investments while the values are down. And then maybe it'll be coast all clear in a year or two or three, and then you give up that day or two a week. But just remember, five days of work, two days off, completely different than two days of work, five days off. Krista? Joyce in Ohio has a question that's very related to this. I was hoping to retire in two years. I am putting 20% of my salary in a 403B. My employer matches 3%. I am funding my Roth. I was wondering if I should cut back on my contributions to my 403B and put a little more in savings with the market the way it is. I have maybe three months income in savings currently. Three months, Joyce. I mean, you're doing so much better than the average person with you're saving 20% of your pay in a 403B. You're fully funding a Roth IRA. You got the employer match. This is great. Um, 20% in the 403B. There's only a 3% match. I know this is weird, but do you know that you might actually net more money if you have a typical high-cost employer-provided uh, 403B you might actually end up with more net money taking some of that money and putting it in a traditional investment account, which gives you more flexibility, where you go straight into index funds with it. And the advantage of that is, yes, it is taxable, but it's taxable at much more favorable capital gains tax than any money pre-tax you're putting in the 403B that will be taxed down the road as ordinary income tax and you will have had the usually much higher expenses in the 403B. So I know that's not the question you asked. But as far as uh, taking more money and putting it in savings, you're putting so much money towards retirement. If you wanted to build up a reserve of savings that is, uh, feels more secure right now with the uncertainty in the market, you certainly could each year buy 10 grand of right now of uh, Series I savings bonds. The ro rate floats, but the money is secure, and the feds are paying over 9% on those right now, and that's quite a return for something that's 100% safe, and you got to own those at least a year. It seems like it would be a good place for you to stash money that would give you a little more peace of mind in what's going on in the market, and we've got a briefing to how to buy Series I savings bonds at Clark.com, or you can go to savingsbonds.gov and see how to do it. This is from Ann in Illinois. I want to retire in Las Vegas. I've seen several news stories about the water shortage out west, specifically the record lows of Lake Mead. Lake Mead is Nevada's and several other southwest states' primary water source. And while everyone's talking about a problem, there doesn't seem to be an easy answer. Do I buy now and hope the water problem is si fixed within 10 years? Michael Burry, the investor from the Big Short movie, is finding ways to invest and or short water sources or products. All this has me nervous. Thoughts on any of this, Clark? I've spent a lot of time thinking about the Western water lo uh, woes. And, you know, you in the Midwest, you've got plenty of water supply. Uh, there are certain parts of the country that uh, having issues with a shortage of water, that's just not in the cards. But the Mountain West always has been an arid region that has done so with the, um, with the federally financed huge water projects, the canal projects, all that, the reservoirs. And now all those efforts are really not doing well because of the lack of winter snowpack. There's been a winter snow drought for 20 something years, more or less. And so you got this shrinking supply. So here's where push comes to shove with Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, Salt Lake, um, Boise, any of the mountain states' population centers. 
is residential and commercial hotel all that consumption of water accounts for like five percent of the western water supply overwhelmingly it is agriculture and so what i worry about more than the urban dwellers in vegas where the actual water consumption is relatively tiny compared to urban dwellers elsewhere in the united states i worry about what they're going to do about agricultural irrigation that that's where i think when it really comes down to it it's not going to be the risk to the urban population centers and suburban population centers it's going to be to the farmers but only time will tell if i'm right on that but the urban consumption is so so small and did you know the the vegas casinos are such good users of water that they are so good at conservation that they use something really tiny like three percent of the las vegas metro area's water you yeah. think that they would be a massive consumptor so it really is truly about agriculture above all else so go for it i i would not not go because okay. of the water shortage and for- thank you for getting me to spit that out <laughs> in the end jennifer in north carolina says hi clark will you please clarify how the irs tracks cash bank deposits i heard that if you deposit a specific amount of cash six hundred dollars into your bank account the irs sees that as income and will send you a tax bill is this correct and if so what is the amount or is it a total amount of deposits in a calendar year okay it doesn't work exactly like that so this came up so much recently because a lot of people were hiding income through getting money through venmo cash app paypal PayPal, uh trying to think what else and so the irs said now wait a minute you know after a certain amount of money people are getting money not passing money among friends they're getting money for work and not reporting the income so that's where this came up uh what you deposit in your bank account only becomes of interest to the government with deposits passed if i remember right ten thousand where people get involved potentially in money laundering and it doesn't mean that you're in any kind of trouble it just allows the government to to know that you're uh, doing large amounts of money moving in and out of an account. That's why there's so much effort with the drug cartels to launder money in ways through um, legitimate businesses so that it throws the scent off the dogs of the government trying to find people that are engaging in large-scale illegal activities. So depositing money in your bank account is not a big issue and nothing to worry about yeah and you're not going to get an automatic tax bill but save maybe save documentation if you have like save copies of the checks you deposited or only if you have really large transactions sure okay i mean you know if you if you're if you're just depositing eight hundred dollars in your bank account no the government isn't coming for you yeah Uh, and besides even if they had the intention here's the funny thing about government people think that there's like this endless army of people that are watching everything you do that's only in communist china we don't have uh the efficiency even if we had people diabolically wanted to do that kind of stuff we don't have the capability at government of any level now that being said if a particular local prosecutor really decided they had a grudge against you and wanted to come after you they can really make it the worst year or so of your life. But that's not what we're talking about here. So coming up next, let's talk about something that you feel every single week. That's what it costs you when you go to buy groceries. And I want you to save every way you can. And there are a variety of apps that supposedly are going to help you that are much in the conversation today. I want to tell you, we've been looking at this as a way to save money i want to talk it through with you anytime grocery prices get to be really high and it really is the escalation in prices people focus so much on how to save money on them it's like 
a standard pattern that when we are in a time of escalating grocery prices, you got everybody's attention. And then when prices level off or start to come back down, people go back to old grocery shopping habits. Obviously, right now, with grocery prices having gone up, they were already on an upward tick. And then Russia invades Ukraine and bam, they took off. Now we're looking at grocery prices. Uh, basically, every dollar is buying you 10% less than it was buying you before if you just buy exactly as you did before. But there are lots of things you can do to make a difference. I've talked about many of those with where you shop, how you shop in that store that you do shop at. You can have significant impact on what the grocery bill is. And it's driving me crazy when I go to my neighborhood Aldi, how suddenly it seems like everybody has discovered my Aldi and the checkout lines are long and the shelves don't have as much stuff on them because people who just drove right past it suddenly have discovered it. And they're like, yeah, this really is a lot cheaper. And I've watched, I said, okay, I don't know what this says about me, but the other day I went off the side and just watched what people were buying and putting on the belt at Aldi. And people are very, very purposeful about saving money on all their grocery stuff. They're not just picking and choosing, buying just a couple of things or whatever. I mean, they are doing some serious diving on saving money. And that's because Aldi is 40% cheaper than a traditional supermarket for zero, but requires the compromises. You're buying almost always their private label brands. And I get an earful from my family when they don't like one of the Aldi private labels. Uh, but it is a way that you not only can wipe out the last year's grocery store increases, but you can even spend less than you have traditionally been spending on groceries. But a lot of people are very polarized by Aldi. They're like, I'm never going in that place again. I hated it. And so you're looking at more traditional ways to save on groceries than going to a hard discounter like Aldi or some people along the Eastern Seaboard are familiar with Lidl, L-I-D-L, or another German supermarket chain that's come in the U.S. Aldi now apparently the third largest supermarket chain in the United States. So then you're starting to look more conventional ways. And we've done a deep dive and refresh on our review from years ago of Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A. It's the one of all these various rebate apps that has truly stood the test of time. But I want to tell you, there's work involved. But Ibotta has the way of you being able to double down or triple down on your savings because you get the Ibotta money, you get whatever's on sale, you get the sale price. And if you're using any kind of rebate credit card, like a cash back card, you're getting that money as well. But you've got to be with Ibotta or any of these other apps, and Ibotta is not just groceries, although people's focus right now seems to be on the grocery aisle with Ibotta, and I'll spell it I-B-O-T-T-A, that these apps can save you money, but don't try to do three or five of them because you'll just basically shut down. There's too much work involved, and you have to be intentional about using Ibotta or one of its competitors. But if you do the process, you follow it, there are real deals that you can, uh, you'll see significant savings over time. And every time you hit 20 bucks, you can have them send you that money. So it stays like in a suspense account. When you get to 20 bucks that you've earned in cash back rewards, they'll then send it to you off in PayPal or something like that. And we've got a step-by-step -step guide that walks you through how to use Ibotta, again, newly, freshly updated, and shows you how to get the most savings from it. But you know my base strategies are for you to buy in bulk when stuff is on sale that is non-perishable or semi-perishable. And that's like, oh, duh, who doesn't know that? But I also do something else. 
when something's on the list and by my judgment it's too expensive, I pass on it. And that's what shoppers do that are putting the dollar first is that when you're shopping, you have a list and you say, we've got to buy this and this and this and this, but you do different things. Uh, Krista is here with me and you've talked before about these apps that let you figure out based on what food you have, what you can make from mm -hmm. it. It's true. So instead of looking at, oh, well, the list says I need to buy this, but look how expensive that is today. You don't buy that. And instead, you buy what's on sale, and then you use like these, a website. I think I've seen. I, I don't have them off the top of my hand, but um, yeah, there are websites that you put in the ingredients you have, and then it pops out a recipe. So. I was so impressed. We were when I first learned about this was probably 15 years ago. We were on a staff trip, and we were staying in a number of condos, and. So the last night before we were coming back, uh, Krista said, why don't we see what everybody has, put it in this program, and see what we can make from it. And we had, we instead of throwing food away that we had not used, we were able to use most of it to make items. And so that's, uh, you know, we as Americans throw away 40% of the food that we buy. That's what I've been told. That's a huge number. If you're able to use the ability to zero waste, as it's referred, your food that you already have, think about what a difference that makes in your budget. So I want you to know there's not a single strategy, but there's several things that work, including at the initial throughput, using an app like Ayabata, or you may have a a competitor of theirs you've really liked. We've been the happiest with that one. You use these and you can generate the savings. And if you really want to be thrifty like me, you change where you shop, you learn to love the store brands or buy the store brands you love. And that way, just by breathing and walking through that store, you save money. So, so one of the apps and websites is called supercook.com. And so you just put in the ingredients you have and it pulls up recipes that are on different sites and you click through to the recipes. Pretty cool. Shop your own pantry. I um, love that. All right, we'll go to questions now. Chris in Oklahoma says, way to go, Clark, on advising a listener to think about how to use COBRA insurance the correct way. Twice in my career, I changed companies and my outgoing HR manager had mentioned this possibility to me. Twice I saved my premium money in case of an emergency to get my COBRA coverage current. And in both cases, I came out on the positive side. I didn't need the insurance and was able to save the money. Just remind folks to save the premium money in case of an emergency to keep your insurance current with your old company. Okay, so thank you so much for mentioning that, Chris. And just very quickly, explain what we're talking about. So you leave a job with a big employer and they leave you. You're eligible in almost all circumstances for a COBRA, the uh, Consolidated Omnibus budget reconciliation, uh, something, something, whatever, whatever COBRA stands for, ACT. So part of this, this huge law is that you have the ability to maintain your health coverage with your prior employer for a period of time, usually depending on the circumstance, one year or two years, simply by... Um, exercising your right by a date certain and the company will send you a notice that you have to exercise your COBRA right by that date certain. Well in the meantime you might have another job, you might because of a status change of employment you might have gone on uh, healthcare.gov and bought an individual policy um, or you may be rolling the dice for a while but it's a way that you can roll the dice and you don't lose is what Chris is talking about. Because let's say you do have an illness or injury during the period of time you can exercise your COBRA rights. Well, if you do what Chris talks about, you save the premiums you would have to pay, which are huge, by the way, under your COBRA rights, because you have to pay the, the full employer cost plus 2%. So normally as an employee, you're paying only a tiny amount of the health insurance premium. Under COBRA, you got to pay the whole thing. 
So Chris saves that money. If he gets through that period of time, has, has his new job or whatever coverage he's going to have, and I say Chris, Chris could be a man or a woman. I keep saying he. Anyway, so you, you can then put into place the COBRA coverage if you need to. Otherwise, you never spend that money and you're good either way. Apologize to all Norwegians if I pronounce this name wrong, but I found three pronunciations on the on the web. Trigva in Washington says stock prices are down now, so this seems like an excellent time to convert a traditional IRA into a Roth. Or am I missing something? If this is indeed a good time to convert, what should I know? You're completely right, and I apologize. I did this on television. I completely forgot to do this on the podcast. That. With the one upside of the recent declines in stock market values inside a traditional IRA is this is a wonderful time to convert a traditional IRA to a Roth potentially. Now, if the market continues to go down, then it wasn't as wonderful a time, but always it is the upside of the downside when there's been a market decline because you, if you can afford to pay the tax, you convert traditional IRA to Roth money, that Roth money then grows tax-free the rest of the uh, years or decades that you would have for it to grow. And then you take that money out tax-free where everything in a traditional IRA is kind of like a tax time bomb. Whenever you start to spend that money, you have to pay tax on every penny in it. Plus, there are other benefits that may suffer tax or you may push yourself to a higher tax rate. All these things happen with traditional IRAs. And this is from Anonymous. Uh, what's a good step-by-step -step guide to protecting winnings in a big lottery payout? How could I form an LLC or trust so locals don't know I hit it big? What's the timeline on that after matching the numbers? Because, well, no reason really. Okay, okay, Anonymous. Uh, if you actually did win a big lottery jackpot, it is so important to protect that anonymity and to go find a CPA, a, you know, a certified public accountant, and a lawyer who can work with you on the strategies that if the state permits where you've won a big lottery prize, you're able to protect anonymity and you're able to design a plan where you preserve so much of the money. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I have a big bias for, and nobody seems ever does it. So let's say there's one of those things like you go buy tickets for, Krista, that's the big power game mm -hmm, thingy. Like the Powerball or something. Yeah, okay. So obviously I don't play lotteries. But you win the huge amount of money. Almost everybody takes the lump sum. What happens to people who take a lump sum from a giant jackpot, a huge percent end up bankrupt. Isn't that weird? When people are not accustomed to huge amounts of money, it almost like burns a hole in their pocket and the lifestyle gets too big, they make too many promises, they hear too many sob stories from relatives, from long lost, friends, family, you name it. If you instead take the allowance and I know everybody's against the allowance, but if you take a payout over 20 years, 30 years, whatever the lottery calls for, then even if you mess up that first year's money or that third year's money or that fifth year's money, why am I only talking odd years? Anyway, you still have year after year of money coming. What if a state like filed bankruptcy, if it was like a state lottery? Would that? You know, if a state files bankruptcy, we got much bigger issues. Well, than, I you remember know, state that lottery. you know came close to happening a couple of times. Well, that, that happened with a 529 plan. Okay, I'm going by memory. I apologize if I'm wrong. I feel like it was the state of Alabama hmm. whose 529 plan at one time went insolvent. But lottery pools, I that has not been an issue, and that's why I love the allowance every year where you take a payment over 20, 30 years, whatever. So that's my thing. Okay. And I know 
that nobody agrees with me on that. I mean, really, you look, everybody takes the one sum check for a smaller amount of money, pays the tax, and they go off and do whatever. What would I do if I won a lottery? Give it away, knowing you. I, I would have, I, there would be no purpose of having that money in my life. You could build more habitat houses. You could do a ton of stuff. That I could do is, ex- I well, can give you I my do, bank account numbers. What I would do, you know, I think about that. I wonder if you can do this. I would just uh, give the winning ticket to something like Habitat yeah. or something like that, and then they would redeem it. Then I wouldn't have to worry about any of the the shenanigans with tax and all that. Well, anyway, enough about enough about all that. Uh, what do you call that stream of consciousness mm-hmm. coming right out of me? I hope today you heard something that was useful to you that you can put to work in your life. That's the key. I don't want you just to hear information from us. I want it to be information you can act on to make a positive change in your life. If there's something you're doing with money, you're like, ooh, I could do better than that. I could do better at that. If you can grab that and improve your life, because life really is about continuous improvement. And if you heard something that you think would really help a friend or family member, if you think the suggestion would be useful, go ahead and give it to them. And I want to thank you so much for being with us today.